Hi, everybody. Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is the great engineer and producer, Al Schmidt. But first, let's talk about submitting your songs to iTunes. If you've ever tried to submit anything to iTunes, you know that you can't do it. The only way that you can submit anything is through an aggregator like CD Baby or TuneCore or DistroKid, which is my current favorite. So what does it take to submit to iTunes? Well, they're pretty stringent. They want you to be a record label with at least 20 releases, 20 albums. But each album also has to have a UPC code. All the songs have to have ISRC codes. You need a U.S. tax ID, and you need an iTunes account. When that happens, you can download something called iTunes Producer. And iTunes Producer is really interesting because it actually serves a lot of purposes. If you want to submit a book to iBooks, for instance, use a version of iTunes Producer. If you want to submit a podcast, use a version of iTunes Producer. But if you want to submit songs and albums, you still use iTunes Producer. It's just a slightly different version. Actually, it's the same version, but it's locked off if you don't have the criteria to have a label account. So iTunes Producer is actually pretty neat because unlike a lot of submission engines for Pandora, for instance, or any of the other online streaming services or download services, or even for TuneCore and CD Baby, you have the ability with iTunes Producer to add an extensive amount of metadata, mainly because it makes it easy to find within iTunes. So iTunes Producer is what you want, but you need the criteria in order to get to iTunes. So once again, the alternatives are to use an aggregator like CD Baby or TuneCore. The advantage of that is you only have to upload your album or your single once. And then they'll get it to iTunes, but they'll get it to all of the other streaming services and download services at the same time. And that's an advantage rather than having to go through each one. Now, the disadvantage is you have to pay for it. So either you're going to pay up front and a yearly fee like with TuneCore, or you're going to pay a percentage of what you earn with CD Baby. But again, if it's the only way to do it, then obviously it's worth it. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Don't forget about my new coaching program called 101 Mixing Tricks, Big Studio Tricks for the Small Studio. And you can go to 101mixingtricks.com to find out more. Speaking of mixing, let's talk about the five most common mixing mistakes. Every day, people ask me to listen to some of their songs. And I'd really like to listen to all of them. I just can't get to it, frankly, because, hey, there's a lot to do in a day. And, you know, take some time to sit and listen to some songs, especially when someone sends you a dozen of them. So I don't get to this very often. But when I do, I find a number of mistakes that are common that I always hear. Now, on the other hand, don't get me wrong. There are some that are absolutely great. But a lot of people are learning. They're neophytes. And they make some mistakes. So what are they? Well, number one is the vocal gets lost. So in other words, at different parts of the song, you miss a word, you miss a phrase, something like that. And the reason why is they usually just bring up the fader to where it sounds good in the mix at a certain place, and then they leave it there. But in fact, what you should be doing is use that automation that every DAW has and go through it once, twice, three times so you can hear every single word and every single syllable. And of course, that also applies to lead instruments as well. So if there's a solo, or you know, you do the same thing. Or if there was a lead line or something, then you do the same thing. So that's number one, vocals get lost. Number two is there's a big frequency bump. What ends up happening is you'll have somebody that will solo a track in the mix and then EQ it to make it sound good. And they'll go through every track and they'll EQ it but they find that they end up using kind of the same frequency all the time. And it may be because there's some deficiency in their speakers, for instance, or in their playback environment, but they're using the same frequency all the time. And as a result, when you play the whole mix back, there's one frequency that kind of jumps out. What makes it worse is you also have certain elements that are covering up others, they're fighting. So you don't hear anything clearly. 
So, of course, the way around that is if you're going to solo, solo up a number of elements at the same time, and especially ones that are kind of fighting or close to one another, and EQ them in different places. So, for instance, instead of 2.5K, you might EQ at 2K or 3K or a little bit higher, and that will give it some separation. The other thing is you don't always have to add EQ to boost EQ. You can also attenuate and take it away. And a lot of times it sounds even better. So, for instance, if there's one element that's boosted at 2.5K, another one that's fighting, you might want to decrease it at 2.5K. And what you'll find is all of a sudden everything will sit better in the mix. So that's number two. There's a big frequency bump in the mix. Number three is a mushy stereo spectrum. So in other words, there's nothing distinct in the stereo spectrum. And usually this is because of one big thing. And that's there's a lot of stereo elements and they're all panned hard left and hard right. And what ends up happening is you get something that my friend from Nashville, Ed C, calls big mono. Big mono basically means that there's so many things panned in the same place that it really sounds like mono. You can't hear any definition. Really, there's only three places that you really want to question when you want to pan them. So in other words, hard left, hard right, and in the center. There has to be a really good reason to put them in any of those places. And you'll find if you use the rest of the spectrum, and just like EQ, have each one of your elements of your tracks have a different place within the stereo spectrum, and you'll find that not only will the mix sound better and feel wider, but you'll also have space for each element, and it will sound better too, and there'll be less fighting. So that's number three, mushy stereo. Number four, too much compression. Compression sounds great. We really like the sound of it, and because we like the sound, it's really easy to add too much. And this is a couple places. This is adding it both on the individual tracks and also adding it on the stereo bus. But especially on the stereo bus, it's really easy to crank that sucker and all of a sudden the mix sounds small and also there's no dynamics. It doesn't feel good. So a way around that is just be careful how much compression you use. What you'll find is a lot of the hit makers won't use too much. A dB, two dBs, something like that. Definitely not more than five. And you'll find the mix will sit a lot better and and it will breathe a little bit. So that's number four, too much compression. Number five, too much low-end EQ. This is really common. and Everybody does this from time to time, and it's happened to me a lot, where what you'll find is your listening environment has a deficiency on the low end. So what you try to do is make up for it and add way too much. It could be because of your speakers, and perhaps you have small speakers with a 5-inch or even an 8-inch driver, and you just don't hear the real low end that you want to hear. It could be your listening environment, and perhaps what's happening is there's some room modes that's sucking out a certain frequency, a certain low-end frequency. So in other words, there's a phase cancellation in your room. Whatever the case you're having a problem hearing the low end. So as a result, you keep on adding more. And when it sounds great in your room, when you take it outside, it just sounds way, way, way too much. One of the problems too is sometimes EQing below 100 cycles to make things sound bigger. And this is especially true for the kick and the bass. And one of the things you'll find is if you EQ higher, it's going to sound better, and it's going to sound better, especially on smaller speakers. So, for instance, with the bass, if you EQ it more in the 200, 220, 250 range, you're going to find that it's going to work a lot better in the mix. You're going to hear it a lot better. And, of course, you want to add some definition, and that might come at 700 cycles or so, and or it could come at 2K or both, for that matter. The kick drum, you might want to put at 80 and start there because... That's where the resonant frequency of a lot of 22-inch kicks happens to live. So if that doesn't work, move it up to 100. The problem is when you start to go down to 50 and 60 cycles and basically less than 80, you can't hear them really well on most small speakers and in most rooms. So what ends up happening is you add too much. So one of the things you can do to get around that is to just listen to some other really, really, really well-mixed songs. Get a CD, get the highest quality recording that you can, and play a bunch of them back. 
and see if you can try to match the sound of the low end. And you'll find that there may not be as much happening below 80 or 100 than you think. Those are the five mixing mistakes that I hear the most. One, the vocal gets lost. Two, there's a big, big frequency bump because there's too many instruments being EQ'd in the same area. Number three is a mushy stereo mix, meaning that a lot of things are panned hard left and hard right rather than using the rest of the stereo spectrum. Number four is too much compression because it sounds so good you keep on wanting to add more. Number five is adding too much low end. So with that, if you're having trouble mixing or if you just want to learn more about how to do it, go to lynda.com and lynda.com has some of the best video courses anywhere. I think they have about 2,500 on just about anything you can think of from any kind of software, for instance, to business. And they also have an audio section. I have 16 or 17 courses, but two of them that would apply here is the audio mixing boot camp and audio recording techniques. I'm going to give you seven days of free access to lynda.com. All you have to do is go to the bottom of the page. If you're on bobbyowinnercircle.com, just look in the comments and you're going to find a link and just take that link and you get seven free days. My guest today is truly a legend, Al Schmidt. Al has won 21 Grammys for his work with great musical artists like Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, Toto, Ray Charles, Diana Krall, most recently Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan, and Neil Young. I did this interview at NAMM, and this was done for lynda.com. And what they asked me to do is go into a suite in a hotel and interview a number of the real greats in the business. And the first one that we did was Al Schmidt. Have a listen. This was done on video, by the way. It was a five-camera shoot, and it looks great. I'll also put that link up as well. But now you'll hear just the audio from that interview. So here's Al. Al Schmidt is one of the music industry's best known and most revered recording engineers. He's worked in over 150 gold and platinum albums and has won an astounding 23 Grammys for his work that spans multiple musical genres, including Henry Mancini, Diana Krall, Toto, Steely Dan, and Paul McCartney. I'm honored to speak with Al Schmidt. Thanks for being here, Al. My pleasure. Let's go back to the beginning. What, how did you get into the recording business? <laughs> well, it started when I was eight. My uncle had a recording studio in New York City. And uh, I used to get on a subway every Saturday, go over to his studio and spend the weekend with him. He was my father's brother, and he was also my godfather. And he didn't have any children, so I was like his son. And uh, I would go and clean patch cords and help set up chairs. And, and people like Art Tatum would be there, and uh, Bing Crosby would come, and the Andrew sisters. and. You name it, you know, just, I would spend every weekend there uh, from the time I was like eight until I was about almost 13. I would go over every weekend. But th there weren't many recording studios back it then. Was, his was the first independent recording studio. He, had, he was an engineer for Brunswick and then left there and started his own place. Yeah. He broke in so many guys, you know, that were, you know, outstanding engineers at the time. Yeah. So anyway, I, that was it. I always wanted to be like him, you know. We were kind of poor, uh, living in Brooklyn, and, and he had a beautiful apartment on Riverside Drive. Uh, he always had a lot of money. He, always he took me to the fights. He took me to hockey games, uh, you know, as an eight-year-old kid. And I get to meet all these people. Yeah. You know, Art Tatum would take my hand and show me little boogie-woogie licks on the piano. It was amazing, and it's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah. So, so then you went to the Navy, right? And then yeah, when I was 13, you know, I mean, I, I stopped going over there when I was 13. I started hanging out with a gang and uh, getting in trouble. On my 17th birthday, I enlisted in the Navy so I could get away from the, because I, I, half my friends were in jail, mm. and I knew I was heading that way if I didn't do something, so... I got in the Navy and uh, spent a couple of years in the Navy. When I came out, I was gonna to go to college and my uncle called me and he said a friend of his had a studio and they were doing all the jazz records and all at that time. It's called Apex Recording Studios. 
and they were looking for someone to break in, and would I be interested? I said, of course, you know, sure. So I went over and interviewed to, uh, for the job with the guy that owned it, his name was Bob Schewing. Uh, they hired me and I started on, on a Monday and he took me in and introduced me to uh, this engineer who was gonna be my mentor and, and uh, it was Tom Dowd. No kidding. So from Tommy and I liked one another right away. We got along really well and uh, and he was, you know, responsible for so much of what I learned early in my career. Well, he wasn't that much older than you then, was he? That's right. Yeah, he was older than I was. He was. Um, he had been in the. Uh, he was doing all the Atlantic Records yeah. and all that stuff. And what happened was, there was another engineer by the name of Otto Oftring, I think. And he was a German engineer and he wore a monocle and he clicked his heels. I mean, it was unbelievable. Really? There, really. People were actually like that, huh? Yeah, that yeah. Works. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was like something from a movie. And um, so I remember that he was, uh, he was doing some of Atlantic Records and he wanted more bass. And he said, no, you, you have enough bass. I can't give you more bass for whatever reasons, you know, because he wore the white <laughs> smock and all. Yeah, yeah. So the next session they had, they, they asked for Tommy. And when Tommy said, when they asked Tommy for more bass, he gave it to him. And they loved him for that. And uh, so they started using Tommy all the time. And then, you know, I broke in. And then <clears throat> when Tommy couldn't do something, I did it. And, uh, you know, I, I, the first hit I had was a, a record by the Clovers called uh, Don't You Know I Love You. And... Uh, it was back in those days, it was called Race Records. Yeah, yeah. And it was a big race record hit. And then Prestige recorded there, uh, National Records recorded there, a, a company called Abbey. And these were companies that were doing a lot of jazz work, you know? So I got to, to work with all the top, top guys, you know? Yeah. Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, you name it, you know? and. Uh, and I was a bebopper as a kid. I just loved bebop music. And, uh, Must have been heaven then. I was in heaven. I was like, I died and went to heaven. So that was basically the start of it. Then the, the company, believe it or not, the guy that owned it was an alcoholic. And he just had a shutdown. He drank all the profits up and everything. And so they went out of business. So, uh, Tommy went to work for a studio called Coast Fulton Recording. And I went to work for a little studio called NOLA, which is, was a rehearsal studios, and they had a little room to record. And I was there for about a year, I guess. And then I got a call from Tommy saying the studio that he worked at, Fulton, were looking for somebody and another engineer, and he recommended me. And so I went over there and, and got the job and, and uh, with a lot more money and all, and so it was a nice boost up for me. Yeah, yeah. So all in all, Tommy and I were together about eight years, except for that one year that we were away. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, I, I had no idea that you know there was a connection. I I yeah. knew you knew him, but I didn't no, realize no, no, that he was no. a mentor. We were, I was like his kid brother. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, how did you get to California? Oh, uh, that's another little story. Um, I started doing a lot of jazz stuff, and uh, you know I was getting a good reputation. And Dick Bach, who owned World Pacific Jazz, would come to New York to use me. I was, I was, I was doing uh, <sighs> Jerry Mulligan and uh, um, Chet Baker. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, Jim Hall and Bobby Brookmeyer, the street swingers, wow. for him. Yeah. So he had jokingly one day we were, we were <coughs> excuse me, we were in the studio, and he said, you know, Al, if you came out to California, I wouldn't have to come all this way to use you. And I said, to him, well, give me a job out there, and I'll come out. That was it. Three weeks later, I get a call from. I got you a job out here, Al, if you really want it. It's the best studio in, in Los Angeles, radio recorders. They're doing all the top stuff. Uh, and they're, they're looking for somebody, and I played them your work, and they're anxious to have you. So and I moved to California. Radio recorders, yeah. That... Yeah. And then we were doing all the RCA stuff there, and Bones Howe 
was a great engineer. Yeah, yeah. He was doing this record with a, the producer was Cy Reddy and the artist was Henry Mancini, unheard of artist, doing a TV show called Peter Gunn. Yeah. Well, Bones and uh, Cy Reddy got in a beef over something. I have no idea what it was. And Cy kicked them off the record <coughs> and brought me on. Yeah. And that was one of the big breaks of my career because then I started doing everything for RCA. And then when they opened their studio in, I guess it was the middle of 1959, I was the first engineer they hired. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was doing all the RCA stuff there and, and staying busy. I was doing three dates a day, six days a week. I'd go, I'd do nine to 12, two to five, eight to 11. Six days a week, I was I just so busy, and everybody wanted to use me. I it was a new studio, and it was a great room, yeah. uh, you know. And I was making hit records, and yeah, you yeah. know, so it was cool. I was doing Ike and Tina Turner and the Ikeettes, and and Billy Eckstein and Billy May, yeah. and uh, um, Rosemary Clooney and Gordon Jenkins, and classical music. I was doing uh, country music, Bobby Bear. So it was just an incredible way to learn. Yeah, yeah. And learn different microphone techniques and, and anything we needed, they got us at RCA. You know, we had all the latest Neumann microphones and, you know, so money was no object. Yeah, yeah. And it was at the NBC building on Sunset and Vine that we had the two studios. And the only thing there was You Bet Your Life with Groucho and the, and the 11 o'clock news. So I got to see Groucho all the time, which wow. was kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Every time he passed me in a hole, he'd have a remark, you know. <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me about Sam Cooke. You did Sam Cooke? Yeah, yeah. I did all the Sam Cooke things. I was his engineer for a long, long time. Um, I did, you know, uh, Bring It On Home and Cupid and Twisting the Night Away and, uh, you know, Another Saturday Night, uh, you name it. All you know, the big all, ones, all yeah. The, yeah. A lot of the big hits. Wow. Uh, Hugo and Luigi were his producers at the time. And then I went into production at the RCA, and once I got into production, I couldn't engineer anymore. You know, they had strict union rules union? there. Oh, yeah. But Hugo and Luigi uh, was starting their own label, at Atco, uh, Avco. I can, forget what the name of the label was. I think it was Afco. Um, and so they left. So uh, Sam Cook, since I had worked with him so much and he liked me, we got along so well, asked me to be his producer. On, uh, so I started producing Sam and, and I did uh, the, uh, the shake, the whole world is shaking. Uh, when a boy falls in love, I did the Copa album live at the Copa yeah, yeah. in New York. Wow. I was with him, I had dinner with him the night he was killed. Yeah, he was a dear, dear friend and, and I still miss him today. And, and there was nobody like him yeah. in the studio. He was an amazing talent, great writer, incredible he is. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. Well, okay, here's a question I've always wanted to ask you. Jefferson Airplane. Oh. So you did, uh, well, I guess the second and the third Jefferson Airplane. I did, I did. Uh, Volunteers, I right? did. No, that was the fourth one. I did After Bathing and Baxter's, Bless Its Pointed Little Head, uh, Crown of Creation, and Volunteers. Okay, yeah. And then I did also did uh, the uh, Hot Tuna acoustic yeah. album yeah, yeah. with those guys. Well, what I noticed, uh, I was hoping we were going to do this, so I went back and I did some listening, and the first Jefferson Airplane record is really swarming and reverb and everything, and it's not defined well, everything. Why, and, and when you, your stuff is really crystal clean. Well, and, that's why I was doing it. Yeah. The, Rick Gerard who was a producer, a staff guy at RCA, yeah. and he did the uh, Surrealistic Pillow, yeah. uh, which had, you know, White Rabbit yeah. and somebody low at the big hits. Yeah. They hated him, I, it, not him personally, they hated the fact that they were buried in echo yeah, and yeah. They, they couldn't stand that stuff. Yeah. So they fired him. They said, no, and then 
they, for some reason, like me, I don't, I, I had never worked with them, but I stopped in on some sessions, you know, and watched what was going on, and uh, so I wound up uh, producing them. So, but there was a period when you were a staff producer for RCA, right? And you stopped and you went back to engineering. Why? You couldn't engineer when you became a producer because uh -huh. of the union rules. You weren't allowed to touch the board. Yeah. So I had to stop engineering and just produce. And you but it? I was so busy producing. You know, I had 11 acts from the women folk to um, Hugo Montenegro to uh, Sam Cooke to Eddie Fisher to the Jefferson Airplane, uh, Gail Garnett. Uh, God, you know, yeah, so yeah. I was jamming, yeah, you know, yeah. so I didn't have time to really think about engineering, you know. Uh -huh. But but then you eventually went back to... Well, I did when I left RCA. Oh, I see, okay. What happened, and this is a funny story, I was doing Eddie Fisher in the afternoon from two to five. When I'd finish with him, I'd go upstairs and meditate. I was into transcendental, transcendental meditation at yeah. the time, and... Um, and then I would go down at eight o'clock for the Jefferson airplane. We'd go to four in the morning, mm -hmm. sometimes more. And then I'd go home, get a few hours sleep, come back to work. I had to do my budgets. I had to look for material for my other artists because not all of them wrote. So I was seeing publishers all the time, yeah. you know, to play me songs and all that stuff. So I was just killing myself. So I called my boss, his name was Ernie Alshula. And I said, Ernie, you got to do, do something. You got to get somebody to do Eddie Fisher. I said, I just can't do it anymore. I'm killing myself here. You know, I said, I'm doing this and I'm working like 16, 18 hours a day. And then I, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to get another divorce. And, I, and his line to me was, well, gee, I'll truck drivers do it. <laughs> and I said, Ernie, get yourself a couple of fucking truck drivers. I quit. And I, Attended my resignation. I left two weeks later. Yeah. I was home. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I was home. I got a call from the Jefferson Airplane. They wanted to give us some guys there, and there was nobody that we wanted to work with. We liked working with you. They said that uh, I could, we could hire an independent producer. Um, would you do it? And I said, absolutely. So I wound up uh, independently producing the, the records. And what the funny thing about this was, as a staff producer at RCA, I was making 17,500 bucks a year. I could make a bonus of $5,000 every year, which I did, because my records were selling enough. So I was making 22,500 yeah. with doing 11 artists. Doing one artist, Jefferson, my first royalty check was 50 grand. Wow. <laughs> so I realized I had made the right decision. Yeah, no kidding. And then of course, uh, you know, I started doing a lot of stuff with the Arab, with Grunt Records, with their label. Yeah. So you're um, independent ever since then, right? Ever since, yeah. yeah. You've been mostly an engineer, though. Hey, I, you haven't went too much into production. Have well, when I, yeah, I did. Then? I was producing, you know, I did uh, co produce Jackson Brown. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, that, there were certain artists that I, I, I've worked with that I've produced and co produced. Yeah. What happened was um, my friend Tommy Lapuma asked me, uh, to mix a record for him. And I said, gee, Tommy, I haven't done any engineering in six years. I don't know if I can even do it anymore. He said, oh, sure you can. It's like riding a bike. So I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. But if I feel I'm not doing it, you gotta let me out. Look out. And if you feel I'm not doing it, you gotta let me know, no hard feelings. Because yeah. we were really close friends. Yeah. And uh, what happened was he was doing an artist with Dave Mason. And Bruce Bartnick was the engineer. Mm. And the album was going longer than they had anticipated. And Bruce was already signed to do, uh, to go in with the doors again. So he had to leave. So that's when Tommy asked me. So when I got in and started mixing it and started bringing up the faders and listening to uh, Only You Know and I Know and, and thought, oh my man, this stuff sounds so good. Yeah. This is the reason I got in this business yeah. in the first place, yeah. the capture sounds and the mix. So that was it, and that, that was off and running, back to engineering, and you know, I wound up doing the first two Earth, Wind & Fire records with uh, Joe Wizard, 
Oh, I didn't know you did Earth, Wind, Fire. Yeah. Oh, especially those records. Those yeah, records. yeah, that's yeah. the first one had a girl in the yeah, band. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a great so, record. yeah, yeah. So. Wow. I got a deep history. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, you've done so many different genres, and it goes from classical stuff that you've done to jazz to to bop to Jefferson Airplane to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Is your approach the same? Pretty much, you know, music is music, and and just I would I would listen to what was going on in the room, you know, as I run something down a rehearsal, and I would walk by the instruments and listen to everything and know what was going on, who was playing what or whatever. And then I would go inside and bring up the faders, put my mics where I thought they should belong. And then if there was something I didn't like, I'd go out and change the mic or move the mic. So yeah, whether it was country music with Bobby Bear or, yeah. or whatever, it was music. Yeah. And, uh, and even like poker music, which I couldn't stand. Yeah. But I, it wasn't, I kind of, Null that out and just listen to the sounds. Yeah. Capture the sounds of the instruments. Yeah. So, when pretty you, cool. Uh, when you're doing any kind of record, uh, it doesn't matter, you're doing a recording. Um, what's, take me through like a typical day. Typical day, depending on what I'm doing, but the, whether it's a big um, orchestral date or a big band or whatever. I always get to the studio maybe two and a half hours ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I've talked to my assistant before then, so we have a diagram. We, we, we talk about what mics we're gonna use and how we're gonna set up the studio. So usually when I get there, the chairs are in place, the risers are there and everything else. So then my assistant and I just, we get the microphones, place the mic, what microphones we're gonna use, and where we're gonna use them. We get all that, we check out every mic, we talk into them all to make sure they're right, we don't click them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do click them to make sure some about phasing, but we do talk into them, make sure that they're, they're right. Usually we're done 45 minutes before the date starts and we have a chance to have a cup of coffee and relax. Yeah. And we get everything set up, and but everybody comes in the room, everybody sits down, if it's a big band date, uh, when they, the first rundown, I go by the uh, stand next to the uh, conductor or the arranger and conductor. Mm -hmm. And I, I listen to everything from his standpoint of what's going on. So I know where it's going, to, what's, who's doing what, when, when there's muted brass and open brass and, and you know, muted trombones and so forth. And then I go in the next take down and you know, I, I'm, I'm really quick. I don't use compression or equalization, so I don't have to deal with any of that crap. And it's just a matter of using good microphones. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get my balance and usually that's it and we're off and running. How often do your mic choices change? They change, you know, with certain mics that uh, come like, you know, when, uh, when Royer came out with their microphones, yeah. uh, I had stopped using ribbons for a while because they were noisy and, and you couldn't always, Every 77 sounded a little different, yeah, the 44s, yeah. you know, right? Well, when Royer came out with these great ribbon microphones, God, it was fabulous. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I started using them, you know, certainly on like acoustic instruments. Uh, I started using them on trombones and things. So, yeah, and, and I, I'm a microphone freak, so when new mics come out, you know, I'm, I'm into it. I'm, I want to hear everything and try everything out. What I've noticed about you, um, the few times I've watched you work, is it's so effortless, but your sounds come from your microphones. I mean, you're not one of those guys that, I think most modern engineers, yeah, uh, they're fillers, they're tweakers, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. you're not like that no, at no, all. No, no, yeah, and the reason being, the way I learned, when I learned, we didn't have any equalizers. We had one equalizer, and if it was cinema equalizer, and if you put it in, it equalized everything. Oh, yeah. So you couldn't put it in on an individual thing. Yeah. You couldn't just equalize the bass. Or, yeah. So, so we never used it, and we, there was no compression. We didn't have compression. Yeah. So, uh, so everything was hand compression, riding gain and stuff. Yeah. So that's how I learned, you know? Yeah. 
And then I learned to use my microphones as my EQ, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if something is, if I put a microphone up and it's not quite as bright as I want, I'll, I'll come up with another microphone that I know that's a little brighter and use that. Yeah. Sometimes just moving the mic a little bit makes all the difference in the world. What, what monitors do you like to use? I've been using uh, for, oh, I'd say the last 15 years now, maybe, maybe that long. Uh, Doug Sachs is uh, the mastering lab, you know, the yeah. Tannoy 10 driver yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. the black yeah. case and the, the mastering lab crossovers. Yeah, I use them all the time. Those are, I, I don't know what I do without Which them. Which you can't get anymore. And right, story, exactly. Yeah. And every time I bring something up to Doug, the first thing he tells me, don't change those speakers. Yeah. <laughs> but so, everybody I know that has those, they, yeah. they would never have anything else. Yeah, so. yeah, I love them. But I had 11 of them at one point, and people were on me about them. So, so I gave two away, and then I sold two to somebody that wanted them. But I kept five for surround, so I still have five oh, that's great. in good shape. Yeah, very cool. The music business has changed quite a lot, and you've seen it change more than anybody. It, it's changed considerably, up and down. Absolutely. Where do you see it going? Wow. I don't know, you know, I don't know. I think when, when guys were able to start to make records in their own home, I think that was the demise of studios. You know, so many good studios went out of business because guys were overdubbing in their little home and saving money where you would normally go to a studio to have it done and, and do it. So, so that was one thing that I thought it broke my heart, and, and uh, to see some of these great places go out of business uh, because of that, because there wasn't enough business, and, and one of the reasons was because a lot of guys were doing everything at home. Yeah. Then they started mixing at home in the box and all this stuff, and, and so mixing rooms went down. Yeah. Uh, I'm still the old school. I, you know, I don't use uh, plugins. Uh, I don't mix in the box. Uh, I don't know how. You know, so, and I don't care to yeah, yeah, learn yeah. about it, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm happy uh, to, to when people hire me, they usually have enough money to pay for the studio and, and, uh, and I get to work in the best rooms. And, and in fact, I feel sorry for the guys that work at home all the time because they miss, like at Capitol. I'm out there, my stuff is in the hall, my name's on it. Guys are there, you know, musicians from doing other dates. I run into people all the time. And then I'll run into somebody who'll say, Al, man, are you busy next week? I get, you know, and I get work, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's great. And the camaraderie yeah, of it yeah. all is it's just special, Everybody's you know? And I love musicians, man. man. Musicians are crazy son of a bitches. <laughs> and, and just so much fun to be around, you know, yeah. in, in general. So... Uh, yeah. By the way, congratulations on your star and the Hollywood Oh, Rock how about thing. that? Yeah, I'm not sure when it's going to be. They, they originally told me maybe in January. Now it looks like uh, we'll be lucky if it's in February. I'm hoping that it's done in February and we get it done. It's going to be right out in front of Capitol. Oh, that's awesome. And I told Paul McCartney, I could just walk a couple steps and I'm at your star. So, <laughs> so we're neighbors. That's excellent. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Al doesn't have a website. But he does have a Facebook page, so just do a search for Al Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T-T, -T, and you'll get to his Facebook page. You can also go to allmusic.com or discogs.com, D-I-S-C-O-G-S, -S, for a bio, and also to look at his discography, which is massive. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyoundercircle.com questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. I love hearing your questions and comments. So if you have any, feel free to send them. Many thanks to Steve Cherubino. He's the host of the EDM Producer Podcast at edmmr.com. He helps put this podcast together. He does a great job. Thank you very much, Steve. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyownercircle.com, or find it on iTunes or Stitcher. At bobbyosinski.com or on bobbyownercircle.com, you'll find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I'll see you next time.